Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 21st episode of Patterson in Pursuit. This is another very special episode for three distinct reasons. First of all, we're talking about consciousness and the philosophy of mind again today, which is one of my perennial favorite topics. The second reason is because of my guest. To join me in talking about the philosophy of mind is Dr. John Searle, who is a world-famous philosopher, author of at least 25 different books translated into at least 20 different languages, the author of countless professional articles over many decades, an entertaining philosopher who tries to be clearly understood, which is something of a rarity in the world of philosophy. Dr. Searle is known for his own unique answer to the mind-body problem. His theory is called biological naturalism, And that is what we're talking about today. But before we get to the interview, I want to tell you the third reason why I'm super excited about this particular episode. So because Patterson in Pursuit has been well received by you guys and the audience is consistently growing, I decided it's about time that I look for a sponsor. The difficulty is there's a very, very short list of organizations or products that I would even feel comfortable mentioning on this podcast, much less endorsing. But I did reach out to a company that is literally number one on my list, and they've agreed to become sponsors of the next several episodes of this show. So as you guys know, I'm not exactly the biggest fan of academia. There are certainly some bright spots for sure, and there's certainly some intellectuals doing good work out there. But I think in the next decade or so, you're going to see the obsolescence of the modern form of academia. So most people have assumed for decades that if you want to get a good job, you have to go and get a college degree. But that is actually not true anymore. If you're in college right now and you're unimpressed with your college experience or you want to avoid college altogether, you are not alone. And there is an alternative, and it's the company called Praxis. Praxis will land you a paid apprenticeship. They teach you real-world job skills that you don't get in academia. And after you complete their program, they will guarantee you a $40,000 a year job offer, which is pretty much unheard of, and the net cost of the program is precisely zero. So if that sounds like an alternative that you're interested in or that resonates with you, then head over to discoverpraxis.com. That's P R A. X-I-S. And on their homepage, they have a big button that says schedule a call. Go ahead, click it, talk to them and see if it's a good fit. Now, I personally know the founders of this organization. I give them the highest of marks and I think they are at the very cutting edge of what you might call the obsolescence of academia. But like I said earlier, not all academics are wasting their time in academia. And for this interview, we plunge right back into the thick of things with Dr. John Searle of the University of California, Berkeley. We're talking about the philosophy of mind and his own unique resolution to the mind-body problem. He says scientific materialism is wrong, dualism is wrong, and he tries to find a middle ground. So first of all, Dr. Searle, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. Well, happy to do it. I have lots of questions for you. Um, You have been in the philosophy world for many decades now. And what you're known for is uh, some work you did in the philosophy of language and some work you do in the philosophy of mind. And I'd like to talk to you about the philosophy of mind. Okay. Specifically, what I do in my own thinking and in these interviews is I always want to start with the basics. I think people get too wrapped up talking about advanced concepts yeah. before they even establish the basics. So if we could, can you talk a little bit just about why we should care about consciousness at all? We have a very powerful scientific yeah. worldview that everything <laughs> appears to be reducible to physics. Well, of uh, course. Is there anything? Yeah. Uh, well, the interesting thing is consciousness is, roughly speaking, coextensive with our life. The parts of our life that matter to us are either those that are conscious, like the, you and I are now having, or those that create consciousness, like our health and the state of our body and the state of our uh, brain. Uh, so it isn't just that consciousness is important. It's the condition of anything having any importance is it's important to consciousness. So if you think the political election is important it's because you think it's going to affect uh, the lives of a whole lot of conscious people. If everybody was a zombie, totally without consciousness, there'd be no importance. So it, it isn't just that consciousness is important, it's the condition of anything being important. I see. Now, is there anything that is going on that we should sp- pay special attention to? So we see all kinds of physical phenomena in yeah. the world. We have a theory of the physical world works a certain way. We think it operates yeah. under certain principles. 
but it doesn't have this feature of consciousness. Well, it does. I mean, this is a big mistake in our culture mm. is to suppose that somehow consciousness is not a part of the physical world. It is. It's yes, a physical so part we... of the physical world going on in our brains. And yes. we have so this when we look... tradition uh, that says, no, no, there are two parts of the world. There's a physical part and there's a conscious part. That's wrong. Right. Uh, the, right. the consciousness is part of the biological reality, and that is to say it's part of the physical reality. However, mm -hmm. since this vocabulary of physical and mental was designed to oppose each other, let's just get rid of the word physical. and Let's just say consciousness is part of the real world. It's part of our biology. It's caused by brain processes and goes on in our brain, and it's a crucial part of our biology. And you said earlier that you thought it's left out of physics. Not really. Now, physics properly understood, if you think of physics as a totality of the natural sciences, mm -hmm. then that includes biology, and biology includes consciousness. Okay, so the, the reason I, I think a lot of people like myself get tripped up by this is when we're trying to explain physical phenomena, yeah. we have no reason to interject anything like awareness or feeling Yeah, or well, it depends on how, how thorough you're going to be. Right. If you're just going to explain the structure of the molecule, you don't have to talk about awareness. If you're going to talk about the totality of reality, the totality of reality includes biology, and that means it includes life. It includes uh, photosynthesis. It includes digestion. All of those are parts of reality. And along with photosynthesis and digestion is another biological phenomenon, namely human and animal consciousness. It goes on in human and animal brains. And it's, as I was pointing out earlier, desperately important. Civilization is created by consciousness. Mm -hmm. Now, you said earlier that you think it's a, it's a big mistake that philosophers have kind of divided the world into the absolutely total disaster there are two twin mistakes and they pretend to be opposed to each other but in fact they're the same mistake one is the tradition of god the soul and immortality and the other is the tradition of scientific materialism they both make the same mistake they both say consciousness is not an ordinary part of the physical world so right. god the soul and immortality says there's a separate realm the conscious realm and scientific materialism says, well, either there is no such thing as consciousness, or if it is, it's not really a part of the real world. It's not part of the world of, of uh, molecules, electrons, and photosynthesis. And I'm saying uh, it's obvious that it's part of the real world. It's a biological part, and all consciousness, known consciousness at least, exists in human and animal brains, and it's caused by brain processes. So okay. we've got these twin idiotic traditions. And they both make the same mistake of refusing to recognize consciousness as a, a real part of the real world. Okay, yeah. I think, I think if we're using real world in that way, I think that makes a great deal of sense. However... There's no other way um, to use it. The real world includes everything that really exists, and consciousness exists. Okay, I agree with that. Um, but So a question that I have for you, because I've not been able to sort this out. I have for many years called myself a reluctant dualist because I wish I weren't, because I think it implies some things that I wish it, I, I wish it didn't. So I hope that you can help me sort, sort through this. Yeah, when well, we're dualism about... is so idiotic, it's hardly worth stating. But anyway, a lot of <laughs> our dualists would go ahead. Okay, okay. So let's talk about the actual status of conscious states. So yeah. you say... Is it the case that consciousness is fundamentally something that, that is spatially located oh, somewhere absolutely. in space? And with okay. uh, MRI, you can actually see the spatial location of conscious processes in your brain. Uh, you, you, uh, the brain uh, lights up, certain parts of the brain light up when you think about certain questions. So consciousness mm -hmm. is spatially located, uh, it is, has spatial dimensions, and furthermore, it's like all uh, machine processes. It's uh, defined by energy transfers at electrochemical level, and we don't know uh, what what they are, but there's a lot of good work work going on on uh, brain processing right now. Okay, so is it something, when you say that it, it has some kind of spatial location, does that mean it's something like a, a liquid, uh, something no, no, physical, it's a higher actual? level feature of the brain. Well, it's like okay. liquid in the sense that the... Uh, uh, liquidity is not a separate substance secreted by uh, uh, molecules, so consciousness is not a separate juice secreted by the brain. It's a condition that the brain is in. Okay, so when you say that it's a it's a higher level, uh, yeah, it means it's a phenomenon. the level of neurons and synapses. Uh, there are the features of the whole system. The same way you can't say of any water molecule that this one is liquid. Uh, nonetheless, mm -hmm. liquidity is a feature of the whole system of molecules, so consciousness is a feature of the whole brain. So in your metaphysical worldview, 
you have different states of ontological status. You have base level, and then on top of that, you have something that's kind of categorically higher, and then you have de- like a striation you have of different a, types. Areas of, of dependence. Life depends on big carbon-based molecules, for example. Consciousness mm-hmm. depends on neuronal structures. So you do have dependency relations, but these are all real features. Life is a real feature of the world. So what do you think about um, this way of thinking? This is kind of my own personal way of thinking about different levels of ontology. And I, I think it would disagree with yours, but I wonder what, what your response would be. Yeah. That I, when we're talking about things in the universe, it may be true that you see different phenomena that is dependent on lower level phenomena, base yeah. phenomena. But fundamentally what exists, all that exists, is just the base level phenomena. It's just well, that's wrong. bits of no, matter. Base level phenomena okay. are organized into systems, and the systems have higher level features like solidity and liquidity that are not features of the base level phenomena. So what I, I, for solidity and liquidity, um, I would say something like those are words that we use to describe some higher level status, but it's fundamentally, its existence is something that's conceptual. Solidity isn't actually a feature of physical world. It's no, a word it is, it is a feature of the physical solidity. world. If it weren't, I wouldn't be leaning against this desk right now. Solidity <laughs> is a real feature of the real world. It's a, a causally explained by the behavior of lower level elements, and it is a feature of whole systems made up of those elements. So the okay. table is it, solid. Now, why does it behave in a solid fashion? Well, roughly speaking, when I lean on it, uh, the electrons push back. And the system mm-hmm. of electrons adds up to solidity. In the same way, the system of neuron firings adds up, adds up to consciousness. But solidity itself isn't some independent thing that's in the universe. There's consciousness right? in that sense of independent. You can't carve your consciousness off your brain and put it in your pocket. It's a feature of the brain the same way solidity is a feature of the system of molecules. Okay, so fundamentally, would you say that the, the, the base level constituent parts of the universe have in their nature the potential for conscious Absolutely. awareness. Absolutely, no question. I mean, I, I, that's trivially true. Uh, we know that's true because it happened. Uh, so when I when I say something like that, it makes me think of like a panpsychism. No, this idea no, that no, 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 no. Okay, um, uh, there's so many idiotic okay. things uh, uh, out there said about consciousness, but pan <laughs> is one of the most idiotic. Panpsychism says everything is conscious. Well, no, how could it be? Conscious are some very specific mechanisms, and you might do it without neurons, but you've got to duplicate the causal powers of neurons, and I don't know how you do that. Yes, okay, so not panpsychism as understood as everything is literally conscious. I think my, my understanding was everything has, every bit of the universe has whatever constituent prerequisites that are required to elicit consciousness. Well, that, that, that seems to me not only... <laughs> Uh, implausible, but really preposterous, because consciousness, as far as we know it, is created by very specific kinds of neurobiological phenomena, namely uh, big systems of neurons, and those are very special kind of cells, and uh, 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 the uh, electrons uh, in a a jar of water just don't have anything like Mm. Yes, but if you were to break all of those um, objects down into the constituent parts and rearrange those constituent parts, you could still create something like uh, conscious awareness. Wow. How right. on earth would you do that? That's like saying, you know, if I destroy all the uh, the uh, 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 buildings on the Berkeley campus, I can see the buildings in the pile of rubble. Well, no, not if you destroy the system. That's the conscious it, feature of systems. It's not a feature of electrons. So the consciousness is not actually a feature of electrons. It's no, something. It, it, it's something there's that no additionally. There's no conscious electron. There is no conscious electron. Okay. So the one thing that I think we'll come back to this um, a little bit. I'd like to talk about one other feature of consciousness, which is subjectivity. Yeah. It, it appears it's not, to be it's that the feature. That's the essence. The essence of consciousness is there's something that it feels like to be in any conscious state. Mm-hmm. And for that reason, any conscious state is only exists insofar as there's some subject that so has it as a feature of its awareness. So uh, subjectivity uh, is a, a essential feature of consciousness because it is the what it's like feature, what it feels like. Okay. So would you say that there are two different 
types of ontological status. You have things which are ontologically objective and things which are ontologically subjective. Is that fair to say? Well, okay, but I, I, I don't I'm reluctant to put it that way because that makes it look mm. like we're getting on the verge of dualism. I don't want to right, say that. Right. Uh, my existing conscious state has all sorts of features that are ontologically objective, but uh, nonetheless there are some that are ontologically subjective because that's the definition of consciousness. So those which are ontologically subjective, can we talk a little bit about those? Sure, um, yeah. There are processes uh, that have this feature. There's something that it feels like to be in those processes. So right now I'm thinking about a philosophical question, and there's a certain subjective qualitative feel to that, and that's the subjectivity we've been talking about. That goes okay. on in the brain, and it's essentially tied to a whole lot of brain processes, and those are ontologically objective in the sense that you can observe them on a fMRI. You can measure their electrochemical processes. So it, you would say it would be inaccurate to claim that all phenomena in the universe are fundamentally can be understood as being ontologically objective. Well, uh, obviously, there's some features that are ontologically subjective. That's why we're having this conversation. So can you explain a bit how that doesn't result in something like a dualism? Because well, if I were to take it... Yeah. What happens is there is a, a existing higher-level feature of the brain. There are existing features of the brain that cause and sustain certain uh, forms of subjectivity in the, in the brain. Uh, where's the dualism? So well, if it's, it's the case that these are two separate realms, and that's not right. There's one realm that has a level of description where it is uh, uh, con conscious and has another level of description where it's a, a neurobiological process. But those are two levels of description of one and the same event. So are you saying then the ontological distinction between subjective and objective is purely descriptive? Well, of course, it describes a fact. Uh, and it describes an actual fact, but it doesn't describe two different ontological realms. See, look, when I raise my arm, there's a description of the event where it's subjective. I'm trying to raise my arm. The very same event has a description where it consists of um, a whole lot of uh, let's, uh, neuron firings and the secretion of acetylcholine at the axon end plates of the motor neurons. Mm -hmm. And there are not two different events there. There's one event with different levels of description. However, the descriptions describe real features. I see. So, so <clears throat> when talking about ontology, you would say that ontological distinctions fundamentally are, are about description, that it's a valid no, description. They're not about to say description. They're about the world described by the descriptions. Well, if that's the case, though, it seems like you have some type of existence which is ontologically subjective. Which no, that's is... right. You do have features of this event that are electrochemical and features that are subjective. One event. One event, but two descriptions, not two ontological... No, no. Essence. The descriptions describe different ontological features. When, as I said, when I raise my arm, there's a secretion of acetylcholine, and there is a subjective feel. Okay? Now, those are not two separate events. They're one and the same event described at different levels. In the same way, when I drive my car, one and the same event it can be described as the oxidization of hydrocarbons or as an explosion in the cylinder. One event, two different levels of description. The descriptions describe real features. Okay, so if we take this, um, this perspective, this one event, two descriptions, two, two features, can we talk a little bit about what, what it actually feels like to be in a subjective state? A example that you like to give a lot, I've heard in your talks, is when I decide I want to raise my arm, yeah. Then the, the, you see the phenomena of my arm going up. And yeah, I was and that's a of... conscious event. Raising my arm exactly. is something I consciously do. Exactly. So uh, something that seems, I think, inescapably presupposed when talking about how it feels to be in a particular state is what it means to be a being, like a person or, or a yeah. subject that is experiencing a particular phenomenon. Yeah. So does this theory, how do you explain what a being or a person or a subject itself is? Well, now, there, there's a separate question here. Uh, the question is, does the existence of a conscious state presuppose a self? Mm, yeah, right. Uh, and uh, that's a separate question. Uh, conscious mm -hmm. states no doubt exist. Uh, do, in order to have a conscious state, do you have to have a self? 
and there it depends on what you mean by the self. It, you do have to have a minimal self if a self consists of a unified conscious field. And I think you do have to have that much otherwise. Okay. I couldn't have the present experience of raising my uh, arm. However, a lot of people want much more than that, and that's contentious. That's We haven't got to that yet. That's a separate question. Okay, could we talk a little bit about the self being understood as a unified subject? There has to be. Field. The conscious field I have when I raise my arm comes yeah. as part of a unified conscious field that consists, for example, the intention I had prior and the experience I'm having and the memory of the experience that occurs afterwards. And without an organized conscious field, I doubt very much that you could have the, what we think of as normal conscious experiences. You'd get a kind of pathology where uh, motor behavior would break down. You wouldn't be able to raise your arm. So you do have to have a unified conscious field. Having a unified conscious field, would you say that is a satisfactory definition of what the self is, at least no. for these purposes? No. no. I mean, so many different definitions of the self, I wouldn't know where to start. I'm not sure that the self is a useful notion in this discussion because it means too many different things to too many different people. But let's just talk about mm. the unified conscious field, which is unified both laterally and horizontally. That is, it goes both forward and backwards in time. Uh, so you need a, 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 some kind of a notion of a present experience and some sort of projection and memory to organize it. And that's all we need for this. Now, wh whether or not you, to what extent you have to have a self and what's a sense the self is unified, those are hard mm -hmm. questions and we don't need to answer them just to get up the nature of consciousness. Okay. Why is the reason that so many scientists... Um, and intellectuals kind of recoil at the idea that when we're talking about mental states and consciousness, uh, they think that immediately you're getting into the woo-woo and the spiritual and the well, mystical. This, this, is this, this just this a, a tradition? And the tradition, as I said, there are these two idiotic traditions, and they think they're opposed, but they're the same tradition. One is the tradition of God, the soul, and immortality. And these guys think if you grant that consciousness uh, is a part of a real part of the real world. You're in bed with God, the soul, and immortality, and that's mm. what I'm challenging. I'm saying no consciousness is a part of the real world, but it's a biological part, like digestion or photosynthesis. Of course, it's a real part. We couldn't uh, live our lives without it, uh, but it doesn't follow from that that it's in a separate realm. If we didn't have these idiotic traditions of God, the soul, and immortality on the one hand, and scientific materialism on the other then we would just recognize the obvious facts of consciousness of a feature of our biology. Okay. And I think maybe one of the hesitations that people have has to do with the role of observation in trying to explain phenomena. So would you say that these mental states or the, the actual state of awareness is something that is an, an externally observable phenomena? What you externally observe are uh, both uh, the neurobiological substrates and the physical behavior. But right. the a actual experience itself uh, is not a subject of observation because it has this essentially first-person ontology. I can see okay. that you're awake, but I cannot see your uh, inner feelings. I can't see the, the feeling of wakefulness that you have. So, and when we're talking about that, we're talking about those particular yeah. feelings or those particular yeah. states that are non-observable. You know, is that... the idea that science is about the observable is, of course, absolutely crazy because most of the things that we interested in science, like quarks, leptons, mm -hmm. muons, are not observable. <laughs> uh, but we, we have very good reasons to suppose they exist because they function causally. Right. And you can't observe a consciousness in this sense of observe. You can't observe it. You can observe its effects, but you can't observe consciousness. In the same way, you can't observe uh, subatomic particles, but you can observe their effects. Okay, so if you can't observe the mental states, then it, I thought it, that the idea was fundamentally they are spatially located. Um, That's right. So if if they are spatially located, wouldn't we, in principle, be able to observe them? Well, you can observe. I, I, the effects that they have on nervous systems or rather the form of their realization. So with a fMRI, uh, you can see this is where the guy's thinking about the Tower of Hanoi problem. As you give a guy a problem and you got him in your uh, MRI machine and mm -hmm. you can see which parts of the brain light up when he's thinking about it. That's where the thought process is going on. You can observe the location of the thought process, but the actual subjective experience is not itself an, an object of observation, not even for the guy having it. But, but the subjective experience is something which is certainly existent, but That's right. is, it, is it 
does it have a spatial representation, the actual experience? Of course. I mean, you can see it where exactly it's spatial location in the brain. That's one of the beauty of uh, the, the current advance. Doesn't that mean, I'm sorry, doesn't that mean it's observable, though? I mean, if, if you can but, see okay, it. Okay, what counts is observing it. Yes, you can observe it. You can see. Look, you, I mean, uh, the experimenter is going to say, look, right there in the brain, that's where the guy's thinking about the Tower of Hanoi problem. That's all right. I don't know I'm just by saying that. But you're not seeing the actual. The actual subjective experience is not itself an object of vision by some third person. Uh, but it is located. Of course. Yeah, it is. I mean, we actually now have enough evidence to tell you exactly where it's located. So would you say that there are some um, objectively existent things which have spatial location and yet cannot be located by an external observer? That they're, well, they're... you can locate their... Yes, you can see the spatial location. What you're asking, though, is a category mistake. That is, right. you see the subjective experience. No, you don't. What you see is the spatial location of the subjective experience. You can see its dimensions. You can see how wide it is and where it occurs in the brain, but you don't see the experience itself. Now, I agree. I definitely agree with that, but... So how still... does anybody disagree? This is just science. <laughs> But yes, but but it for me it's that pulls me into something like a dualism because what I would say is there are suppose, some uh, well, real. A, suppose we didn't have this whole idiotic tradition. Uh, suppose we just had sort of contemporary scientific knowledge, then we would yeah. recognize the following: uh, consciousness is uh, a normal biological phenomenon like digestion. Uh, you can locate it in the brain. Uh, we're getting more. Um, uh, uh, and better accounts of its of its uh, neurobiological explanation, and you can see its uh, extension in the brain. You can see exactly where thought processes occur. What's that? now? That's all of that seems to me totally uncontroversial. Forget about dualism and all that stuff. That's all ancient history. Okay, okay. So if we don't use the terminology dualism, yeah. what I'd say is that that leads me to believe something like the following: that parts of existence are essentially personal. They are essentially subjective, yeah. and what that means is there are two types of, at least two types of mutually exclusive phenomena which exist. Well, no, Those... least, they're not mutually exclusive. You cannot have the experience of raising your arm without all, all of the neurobiology, and there, there's one event, as is shown by the fact you can't have one part without the other. You cannot have okay, the experience they... of raising your arm without the secretion okay. of acetylcholine, and you can't have that particular uh, neurobiological processes without the consciousness. Okay, so maybe mutually exclusive isn't the term. It would be something like um, they are descriptively mutually exclusive in the sense that but just by explaining one in more and more detail, you are certainly not explaining the other. So just by yep, explaining more and more brain the processes... The fact that you're not talking about it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. There's a single right. event. It has two different sets of features in a single event, but it's not two separate events. Right. So... For me, it would be something like it, this. If this is true, it implies that the conceptual toolbox we have to reference things which exist in the world has to expand bigger than what the, the traditional scientific well, material no, physical toolbox is too says. idiotic to be worth even um, uh, discussing. But the traditions I told you, the two idiotic traditions are called God, the soul, and immortality on the one hand, and scientific materialism on the other. And I see. Both idiotic in exactly the same way. They both fail to see that qualitative subjective states of conscious or awareness are an ordinary part of the biological world. Okay. Uh, yes, I don't know if I... I don't know if I'd be comfortable saying that they're idiotic, but I would say they're definitely unsatisfactory if you're trying to explain everything. I, idiotic is, <laughs> is a shorter way of saying unsatisfactory. <laughs> okay, I, I'll just ask you one more question. Uh, and this is actually going to be a question coming from um, the philosophy of mind, and I'm going to be dragging you into epistemology, because part of the questions that I've been asking people as I'm traveling around has to do with certainty. Is there anything, any proposition you can be absolutely certain of? And if so, how is that even possible? So the question I would ask for you, I think I know your answer, um, but can you be absolutely 100% certain that consciousness is in existence, that there is such a thing as conscious experience? Of course. Yes. See, <laughs> the point is, um, or the way uh, you have doubts is uh, you have doubts about whether or not your conscious experiences actually represent something independent. 
you know, is there really a person over there in the bushes or is it just the shadows? That's a real doubt. But the mm-hmm. conscious experience doesn't admit uh, doubts about its existence. So your worldview includes absolute 100% infallible certainty. It's not uh, worth using these traditional epistemic notions at all. Of course, am I absolutely certain that I'm now conscious? How could I be mistaken? (laughs) Okay, well, on that note, uh, I really want to thank you for talking with me. This has been a great conversation. Okay, good. Thanks a lot. Fun talk. Thanks, Dr. Searle. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. So that was my interview with Dr. John Searle. I hope you guys enjoyed it. There's a lot more to say on this particular topic. I have a lot more to say on this particular interview, actually. I'll make sure at some point in the future to do a interview breakdown specific to this conversation I had with Dr. Searle. And I intend to do many more interviews on this topic to get a bunch of different perspectives. If you valued this interview and you think this work is important, then please go to patreon.com slash Steve Patterson and you can become a patron of the show, which means you're directly helping to make this show possible. I deeply appreciate all your support and I hope that it is creating value for you. That's all for me today. I hope you guys have a fantastic week.